Thank you, everyone. I see some folks joining the room. We're excited you're with us today. We'll get started in about 30 seconds. Feel free if you'd like to say where you were coming from or where you're calling from in the chat. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, today's episode of NIMWA Exchange is past, present, and future with artist Diane Smith, and we are thrilled to have her with us today. Hi, I'm Addie Gayoso, um, and this is NIMWA Exchange, which is a spinoff of the award-winning pandemic live stream series, BMA NIMWA. I am, again, Addie, and I am the senior educator at NIMWA. Um, and hello, viewers. Thank you for joining us today. As always, we have enabled live transcription which you can show or hide by clicking on the CC button in Zoom. Also, feel free to add your questions to the Q&A or the chat, and we'll do our best to address them today during our conversation. For those of you who are not familiar with our program, each month, hosts of NIMWA are from NIMWA are joined by special guest Center Women Creatives. We consider topics relevant to our world and offer insight into collaborations NIMWA is fostering while its building is closed for renovation. During this time of change, we are excited to exchange ideas with our guests and viewers. Last month, for those of you who didn't join us, we spoke with three women who are integral to the museum's massive renovation project. Sandra Vecchio, lead design architect, Cara Versace, architect of record, and Wendy Jessup, a conservator who specializes in prevention conservation. If you missed the episode, uh, please feel free to watch it on NIMWA's YouTube channel. I will share the link in the chat momentarily. And now I want to pass it over and happy to introduce my program co-creator and co-host, Ginny Trainer, NIMWA's senior curator. Hi, Addie. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm really excited about today's discussion because we are joined um, by my colleague, associate curator Orin Zara, as well as artist Diane Smith, whose works have recently come into NIMWA's collection. And I'm really excited um, to hear from a Diane about her work. So let's um, dive right into it and, and hear a little bit about your work. Welcome, both of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd like to thank you, by the way, Addy and Ginny, for inviting me to um, speak with Diane. I'm super excited um, about this conversation because I'm so thrilled to have Diane's works in the collection. Um, and we'll speak a little bit more about those works in particular, Diane, but first, can you tell us a little bit about what themes you work on in general in your practice and what kinds of ideas and issues do you, do you explore? Well, first, I'd like to start by saying um, thank you for having me on the program. I'm really excited to be here and to speak with you all. Um, generally, my work is centered around my lived experiences, and my lived experiences also encompasses all of the, the things that I ingest, um, some of the things that you all are also um, confronted with, whether it's race, social commentary, women and gender issues, um, things that come from my, my upbringing as a child of immigrant parents and immigration being a hot blood topic in the country right now, um, being a kid from the South Bronx, all of those things are sort of um, enveloped in how I create and the lens in which I create from. So very simply from my lived experiences and all of those things that would come into one's lived experience. So I'm going to um, start kind of going through the, the images that we have here, um, which are more or less in chronological order. So I don't know if you want to say um, just a little bit, maybe, Diane, about kind of the, you know, the beginning of your career as an artist, kind of um, how, how you arrived at being an artist and how you work with what materials do you work? Well, I tend to work with materials that are in my immediate surroundings, but before I really delve into that, let me just spend a few moments and just say that I'm actually, I was actually a painter, an abstract expressionist painter, but even before then a, a figurative painter. I was painting work I was, I thought I was supposed to paint based on what I look like, very figurative, very representational work. Um, and then I got some advice and someone said, um, 
uh, figure out who you are as a painter, find your voice and paint within. My first abstract painting came out and I was quite taken by this work. I had no idea what it was. And I called that person who had become a mentor. And I said, look, I don't know what this is. It's paint on a canvas, but I do know that it's finished. And that's launched my career as an abstract expressionist. And then from there, I just started to feel like there was something much more that I, I needed to say and I needed to find other ways to say it. And um, I stumbled upon three-dimensional works. I was grappling with quite a few things at the time. Um, one was this idea of waste and consumption. And I had so many things in my immediate surrounding and I started to collect them and then they were just sitting around and I was preparing for a dinner party and I had these things and I just started twisting them up and throwing them up on the wall in an effort to clean up. And then I realized, hey, I'm pretty good at this three-dimensional stuff. And then that kind of led me to some thinking about my childhood and what I like to call newly assigned value which just simply means taking things that um, from its original intended purpose and use and transforming it into something else. And I'm sure many of you in the audience and even you, um, us on the panelists can think about ways in which that has happened in our life before we have come to this, this point where we're talking about reuse, where things were handed down to cousins or younger siblings, or in my case, um, with a Belizean upbringing and a South Bronx upbringing in Belize where um, something could be turned into a gourd, a coconut shell, for example, or um, how granny took a little and made it a lot, you know, we were having rice and beans, but it was like a feast, you know, everything had an intended purpose, everything, the simple things became so much more. And so that's kind of how this practice began where I'm making things out of discarded materials out of my own surroundings. And when I started making this work, I thought I didn't have to go pillaging for other things. I had enough of crap of my own to make art with. And so um, these very simple materials become these magnificent works of art, you know, not to say that from an ego perspective, but just the idea of transformation and creating newly assigned value. So this is how I arrive here. And because I'm a painter, everything tends to have a very painterly quality. So the, there, there are some aspects of my paint, my abstract paintings that you would see the idea of form and the use of space and the layering and the idea of texture, all of those things I think uh, are through line in all of my work. Yeah, I, I have been thinking a lot about how multidisciplinary you are in your practice, Diane, but so not just painting and sculpture, but as we're gonna see shortly, film and, and photography. And I have noticed that sort of painterly quality, that texture throughout uh, all of the mediums in which you work. I mean, um, what are the challenges that you, know, you might face or what is your thinking as you work from one medium to another? Or are you kind of thinking about that texture and painterly quality um, as you work from one, one medium to another? I like to think about my practice um, and I say it's, it's, there's this um, idea of it at once being an organic sort of um, performance between me and the material. But at the same time, there's a level of, of control, but also me listening to whatever that material I'm attending to at that moment in time needs. So there's a, there's a, I think it becomes, I remember Deb Willis um, once telling me that she saw my work from a very performative perspective and I, and I begin to embrace that. Um, because there is this kind of dialogue between me and material and there's a performance within that dialogue. And so I, I just use it from an organic perspective. Like we're looking at an installation like this. I went into Barnard College, I did a site visit and I don't always get to do a site visit when I'm doing an installation. I may just see it on, um, in an image but I happened to go do a site visit here, but still yet, even with that site vi visit, same as I would approach a canvas, I may think I'm gonna use blue, red or green 
on a particular canvas or a particular brush, you know, is my thought going to the canvas, but then I get to the canvas and I squeeze out something totally different out of the tubes and pick up a totally different implement. Same as what happens here, I walk into the space and I begin to respond to what the space is. I respond to, this is not a flat wall. So, you know, it's not gonna be this like very straight harmonious thing. So I begin to respond to the intricacy of the space and the walls and the detailings and how do I have that come alive, but then have the paper sort of, um, and this is butcher paper, um, sort of be at one with the space if that answers your question, like how I get there. And typically yeah. this, this particular installation called Stuff is one of, I think about seven or eight that I have done over the years um, in, in homage to Ensa Jacque, um, Shange's poem um, uh, for colored girls. Each of us as artists was given a poem to actualized in a work of art. And I got somebody um, almost walked off with all of my stuff, which was one of my favorite poems. And that's orated by Lady in Green. And this work was so groundbreaking at the time that um, Ntozake wrote it in the 70s. No one was talking about gender issues really, but particularly from a Black woman's voice. But to sort of um, attend to some of the issues surrounding women, specifically Black women, but have it be done in a way that any woman could hear these stories and these choreo poems from all of the ladies and feel connected to it was really something. So I really wanted to do this work justice. So at the time that I got this work, I, I myself had an issue with domestic violence and in order to be um, authentic and transparent with this work, I felt it my responsibility to tell my own story of domestic violence. And so what you have here is how I merge um, uh, different kinds of materials together. So they're, they're the heads, the busts up top that re represent um, ladies in green and the seven women that are in the center video, which includes myself telling our stories of how somebody walked off with all of our stuff. And these stories are stories of reclamation. Um, once we figured out that somebody walked off with all of our stuff, we've all come to a, a, a certain amount of understanding and, and peace and, and level of empathy for those that walked off with all of our stuff as well. And um, the first video where it says Diane Smith Art is actually a video of my face um, that I documented the night of the domestic violence issue. And then the third video, it shows everything I photographed in my apartment as I'm orating the poem. And it's sort of like talking about this idea that when people take your, your physical items, it's, um, it, it's of course not the same as your emotional stuff, but the 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 level of pain and distrust and all the things emotionally that you feel, you're left with those same kinds of feelings. And so is a way to articulate that. Yeah, I'm I'm really struck um, by the the power of the juxtaposition here of this. Um, intensely handcrafted installation of paper, um, really enveloping the technology, right? The, the flat screens um, and the video component. And I think it's really interesting to see because so often um, art tends to be one thing or the other. Um, and I really, I really appreciate that kind of interweaving. Um, of the two to tell this very um, complicated story more completely. It's also um, unfortunately timeless, right? And there is something very kind of like primordial about this installation as well, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the thing about this, you know, and I find um, that I don't think it was intentional, but I, I tend to attend to text a lot. You know, I've worked with um, link, text from Langston Hughes to um, James Weldon Johnson, and it's just something that has happened throughout my career. But specifically with Ente Jacques' work, this text is so 
so layered and so beautiful and so textured. And there's a lot of trauma in that. And it's hard to find the balance to articulate trauma in the space of beauty because mm -hmm. the words are very beautiful. And what's also beautiful is the space that the women are given to articulate themselves. So with these installations, I'm trying to create a very similar narrative. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and Diane, is this a immersive environment? Like, can you walk in between these or is it sort of you, you experience it frontally? You ex this particular installation you experience frontally. I've done others where people can sort of like move in between, but mm -hmm. because of the way, th so when you walked into Barnard College's library, you walked right in, like this was the first thing you walked into. So I think in a way there was also an immersive experience because you walked right into it. And incidentally, this was put up during COVID. So the amount of the staff were were the people that were most engaged with it and and the other part of it where it becomes sort of immersive and performative is when i'm putting up these installations people that are coming by are interacting with me and the installation and telling their own stories as these types of installations are are being installed and just let me just mention that the working with brown butcher paper is in direct correlation with again my lived experience my childhood um there are memories of things that come up as i'm working with this i could think about it, it's the motion of the hands right so when granny was out in the backyard in belize washing clothes on the scrub board and twisting you know, so I'm I'm embodying those motions and I'm embodying her wrist when she was kneading um, bread or making Johnny cake or braiding my hair or any of those things. I'm embodying those things. But then there's also this idea of labor and women in labor around the world. This work is labor intensive. And there's some, there's some undergirding of a dialogue for me that I realized about the idea of labor for women, whether it's the Mashans in Haiti, and I hope I pronounced that right, um, in, in Haiti sitting on the stoop and selling um, their wares at the side of the road, or um, women in West Africa, or um, in my own, you know, where my parents are from in Belize, Central America, it, it's the idea of labor. It's the idea of labor here in America where immigrants, again, we're having this whole conversation about immigration. And in that conversation about immigration, there's a conversation root, rooted in there about labor and what that really means in America and who wants to do the labor. I think the large scale of this work also really foregrounds that idea of labor because you just see it everywhere as you're sort of immersed in that environment. You're really confronted with that hand twisting movement and these like issues of labor that you bring up. And I just think that's such a beautiful correlation between the, the formal qualities of the work and the, the ideas that you want to bring out. Thank yeah. you. Particularly when it comes to women's labor, which is so often invisible. And so the way that you have made it unavoidably visible in this work is really like earning says really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, and oftentimes I'm reminded of in, in my practice, uh, I think it was Desmond Tutu that said, if you want to change the, you know, change the world is that is through the education of young girls and women that really change change things and I think that's one of the ways that I think about how I work also is this idea of of, of being female being black in America being of immigrant parents um, I think it is my duty and responsibility to figure out how to to evoke change in the work that I make mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a great sort of segue into the works that um, are, are in our collection, because that is so much about the story of, of women in America, particularly in Harlem. Can you speak a little bit more about uh, the two photographs and the, and the series in general, this body of work in general, um, Harlem and me, um, and talk a little bit about how time and place factors into this, your thinking of this body of work? Yeah, so. Um... 
there's a series of photographs I've been working on called Between Harlem and Me. Now, this work was really born out of a conversation with a friend. And um, in 2018, my mom passed. And one of the last conversations she had with me was, because um, we would fight all the time about me telling her that she needed to do something. And she's like, oh, I don't need to do it. I'm grown. But <laughs> one of the last things she said to me, and it stuck with me, is that sometimes we get messages and we don't always want to hear it. And people are telling, th telling us things because they love us and because it's good for us, but we have to stop and listen. So keeping that in mind, a friend of mine said to me, you know, I really love your videos and how when um, I photograph your videos, the stills that they make are just so stunning and so provocative. Why don't you think about making a series of photographs? And my initial thing was like, well, no. And then I heard my mother <laughs> and I was like, okay, let me listen to this. And what happened was I had been taking photographs in Harlem since the 90s when I moved here, but they were mostly really personal. And I would just photograph every day interesting things that I saw because I had such a, a profound respect for the medium of photography. I think it is one of the most special mediums out there and we can get into that a little bit later. And so I didn't consider myself a photographer or want to you know, step on a photographer's toes, like here I come, this paint, all of a sudden I'm taking pictures and now I'm the photographer. And then I didn't think that I had a particular aesthetic as the photographer, right? And I'm like, but they're such great photographers. So when this conversation came about and I started to really look at the stills first of the videos and I was like, okay, I know what it is I'm supposed to do. I was using um, archival images from the Schomburg anyway in some of my video work. Um, there was a video installation I did for the Schomburg called Re Harlem for the first Harlem Triennial where I used um, stills and other things from their collection. And I went back to that and I thought, I think I could do this. So I started marrying um, historical images from the Schomburg's collection with my contemporary image. And what I really wanted to do was create a dialogue between the past, present, and future. And that dialogue was sort of like in response to all the things that were happening to people of color in America, particularly Black people. And thinking about on the news, how we're portrayed men and women, um, it's either we're the criminal or we go to this sort of extreme where we're the athlete and the entertainer or the very, very wealthy. And the everyday life that resides in between where, where I find the beauty was overlooked, except for when we were having the police called on us for doing regular, ordinary, everyday things or being shot for walking down a street eating Skittles, you know, by another citizen because they felt it was their right to have jurisdiction over a young man's person because he's black. So thinking about those things, I started layering and um, finding the ways to create narratives to talk about the beauty in the everyday. And looking back at the images, like we've been here, we've been living life, and we've been, the historical images are there to say that. Um, marrying that with my photos, my contemporary photos, is then leaving that same kind of archival documentation plus art artifact for the future. So that's how this came about. And then I was also really wanting to do this absence of the quote unquote white gaze where we're not looking overly performative, right? Because sometimes when you see images of black people specifically in communities like Harlem, there's some overly um, performative thing that's coming through the photograph. I just wanted to show like, this woman was walking down the street that I lived and it was a Sunday and I knew that she was coming or going to church. And she just looked so elegant and, and wonderful. And I just snapped the photo. 
And this is how this image came about. And I don't necessarily, I don't look at the image. It's like I find the images organically and they come together organically. So I don't go looking for one or the other. It just feels right and I put them together. So you had this, this body of your own personal photography already. And then you had access to the Schomburg um, collection. And, and just so people know, can you briefly describe what the Schomburg collection is? Um, yeah, the Schomburg Center um, for Research in Black Culture is here in Harlem. And it's actually five blocks north of where I live, lucky me. <laughs> um, <laughs> But they have, I mean, anything you want to know about um, Black culture and Afri African-American experience, the Schomburg houses so much. And it's, first of all, it's a beautiful institution in that um, it's very welcoming to the community. Um, it has a treasure trove of artifacts and art and photographs and videos and all kinds of materials. There's tons of research that you can do there. Anything that you need, um, I believe they house the Baldwin papers. I mean, it's just a wonderful research to understand um, America through the context of Blackness. I think it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful institution in that sense. So I would, they have an archive that you can go through and I just, started looking at um, going through the archive, the digital archive and looking at um, Harlem um, from the Harlem Renaissance through just going through images of Harlem and anything I could find that spoke to me is what I, I took out of the, the digital archives. And Diane, can you talk us through a little bit with your technical process of what you're doing here um, and you know how many layers of photographs are there in uh, in the previous image I think you had mentioned there were three different photographs a contemporary one that you took and two historical ones but in general how many layers of photographs do um, you use and going back to how I said that I listened to what the material needs, but then I'm also listening to what the artwork needs. Um, this particular thing felt like it needed that kind of layering, where some other ones may just be a two, it's the one historical image and my contemporary image. That, like in this one, that's how it may speak to me. But others may speak to me in a very different way, like something else needs to resonate in a very different way. The first photograph, if you look like on the lower, um, I guess this is my, my left corner, um, you see the men and women dressed a particular way. And that just kind of like that just married with the other two images. And I was really looking at um, this idea of elegance and style and um, grace and the sense of belonging in that dress that was coming through in, in all three images. Yeah, I also love your sense of color. I mean, in the previous one also had color, um, had that really beautiful black cloak. But here also there's something about that really colorful element of, of Harlem culture that you're bringing out that's actually in many of your photographs from this series. Yeah, you know, it's so funny because when I had started printing, when I decided to go through this process, so then that also encouraged me to print some of my other photographs. And I was looking at, I was like, okay, I see this because I was always drawn to black and white photographs. But then looking at the colors, again, I saw my painterly quality coming up and the use of color in the photographs. And I think like something like this, you could kind of see that as well, this photograph in particular is really um, special because I took this not too long ago, just a few years ago, and the structure where the African shop is no longer exists. So again, when I talk about this work serves as a historical documentation and archive for the future. And this is why this work is so embedded in a conversation between the past, present, and future, because no one would know that this African shop was on 125th Street 
between Lenox Avenue and Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard on the northbound side of 125th Street because it no longer exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea of, you know, using archival material, but then also being very conscious that you yourself are creating it as well. The few, and, I, and I love the fact that it's, you know, it's so tied to place, um, location and the history of, of Harlem, but yet, you know, these, these are everyday, everyday scene, scenes, so they're very universal as well. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, to, I'm sorry not to cut you off, but to that point, there are a couple of other things that when I take photographs of, of my community, not only am I looking to represent the Harlem community and where I live and the place that I love so much, but also I think it is my duty and responsibility to represent Blackness at the highest level. And it is my responsibility to do that because I feel like every place else in the world um, where we don't control media, people that look like me, there are other kinds of narratives that are being put forth. So part of my duty and responsibility, I feel as an artist, is to tell our stories with as much dignity and respect as I can. And then it transcends place in that way. So this photograph can be shown in a community in Detroit or Chicago or Los Angeles, and people could still feel connected to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So we've we've talked a little bit about um, your film work as well, which was kind of um, the I guess where this photographic series kind of grew out of. So we have a, a clip, I think, of one of your works, and we can play just a little bit of that. Um, and I, I'm going to have to stop sharing okay. for a second. Um, we'll trade sharing screens. Yeah. I just thought I'd start it from the beginning, Diane, and maybe just show like 30 seconds or so. Is that okay? Absolutely perfect. Yeah. Great. Let's try it. Let's do this. Um, I'm going to share my screen. If this works. went through for everyone. It's a wonderful <laughs> video and it's it's about seven minutes long. So I wish we could share the whole thing, but we'll share the link again in the chat so everyone can watch it on their own time. Yeah, that um, video was done, like I said, that was the first Harlem Triennial and, um, and it was done sort of like in celebration of, of of the community in Harlem. And because it was the first triennial, I wanted to do something that was um, filled with joy and the history and the culture and all of those things. And, and we, we did a one, one evening um, pop-up at the Schomburg and I had a dance party. It was just really, it was fun. It was great. Um, and we played that and that's, that's my music I produced <laughs> for the video. Um, my my little soundtrack um because i couldn't find the right sound and also you know copyright images so i was like well people produce music every day i think i could do this so <laughs> so you have you can add musician to composer to your resume <laughs> as well yeah since since this i think i've done it like maybe two or three other times where i've um Compose music for a particular video. 
Cool. As well as use as well as using my voice. And I think the using my voice is because I really wish I could sing and I can't sing a note. So I've been told I have a pretty decent um speaking voice. So I use that instead as my instrument because I really wish I could sing, but I can't. <laughs> I, I hear you. I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> always wanted to be an opera singer <laughs> in my mind no chance <laughs> i'm tearing the house down <laughs> <laughs> right. and, so, and is the video uh just to uh, talk about is, is it the same sort of historical photographs from the schomburg with your uh with contemporary photography and then sort of the music kind of tying it all together yeah so the video has um still images that I've taken as well as um, video footage that I've used plus the, um, the archives from the Schomburg. Yeah. Yeah, Jenny and I saw the whole video when we first spoke to you and we were just entranced by the whole thing. So I do um, highly recommend that people check out the link that Addy posted because it's, it's an incredible video. Thank you. Yeah, it's really it's really great to see that that layering kind of in motion, um, the kind of like fade in and fade out. Um, that kind of montage is really is really interesting. Um, so we are, and just I'm just going to flip back really quick to to remind people of the of the work that we have. Uh, it's going the wrong way. Sorry. Um, in our collection now, we have these two photographs. Um, of your work in our collection. We are so thrilled to have them. And we're thrilled to say that um, your work will be on view when we reopen to the public next year. And uh, Aureen, yeah, Aureen has curated um, a wonderful section about our photography collection uh, in which your work will appear. And so, Marie, do you want to tell us a little bit about, about that photography section and how Diane's work fits in it? Yes. Yeah, so as uh, people in the audience may know that we actually organize our collection thematically. We've been doing that for several years now. Um, and when we reopen, we are uh, going to have a section that highlights the strength of uh, Nimwa's photography collection um, and looking at the ingenuity of historical artists side by side with that of uh, uh, contemporary artists like Diane's works. Um, and we acquired these works during the closure. So this will be the first time Diane's works will be featured at Nimwa and we're again, really excited and thinking about visual connections first, because that, that's how my sort of curatorial process works. I, I think about how works might have be in dialogue with one another visually. And um, this is on the left, one of my favorites is by Graciela Iturbide. It's one of her famous uh, images of a, a Seri woman in the Sonoran Desert. And I just found that visual connection between that woman on the left with this woman on the right so compelling, um, especially this sort of the way the two figures sort of anchor the image really strong in this sort of silhouetted form, these sort of dark um, outlines against uh, a lighter background. I just thought there was, you know, one frontal, one from the back. It was just a really interesting visual connection. But I also find both of them represent this passage of time, this, you know, the way Diane was talking about uh, the woman on the right in this really beautiful way, how she connects the past, present, and future. And likewise, um, the one on the left, this woman you know, represented this transition where she represented traditional Sari culture. She's in, in traditional um, attire, but at the same time you see a boom box in her hand. So it's also representing um, an influx of American technology into uh, Sari culture. So you know it's this transition between tradition and modernity, at least in the 1970s. I don't think a boom box counts as modern technology anymore. Um, but yeah, I just I just found those ideas of uh, transitions in time and the passage of time and the way these two are visually connected really interesting. So that is one of the ways I'm thinking about uh, highlighting both of these works. And what's really interesting, Diane, is one of our last conversations that you had. You mentioned that this woman, you it seemed like she was flying towards you in a yeah. way. I think you mentioned that, and that's exactly what Graciela said about 
this woman on the left, she thought that she was sort of flying off into the desert, which is why she called her angel woman. And I was just like, okay, I'm going in the right direction. If you're both giving me this anecdote, I'm going in the right direction. Wow, amazing. Yeah. So that, that is one of the ways we were kind of bringing in dialogue artworks across time, plays, genre, medium, uh, and just, again, yeah, showing the innovations of photography in this in this new theme after we reopen. And I'm really excited to, to wow, show them. Wow, that sounds beautiful and exciting. And looking at these two images, I'm also like the idea of what landscape is, right? Because the landscapes are so different, but some, it's really a nice um, juxtaposition. I mean, Diane, it seems like you need to come down and visit when we reopen. And <laughs> maybe you can speak about uh, your work in the galleries. <laughs> absolutely. I would love to. This is exciting. I can't wait. I'm so thrilled that you are able to join us today. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I just want to thank you so much for your time and also for your generous donation of these two photographs in our collection. I'm so excited to see them in person. And um, I just love how this idea of past, present, and future for you and your creative process is very much how our galleries are installed. Um, so I'm excited to see your work in context with um, works by HPD Day as well as other artists. So a big thank you um, to everyone for joining us today. Thank you to Arreen for taking time out of the day and Diane for you as well. Um, it was a pleasure hearing more about your process and your work. Um, and hopefully you can come and visit us when we reopen in the fall. I, you don't have to ask. Place. I <laughs> okay, am there. Great. Awesome. <laughs> thank it's you so been much. Lovely. Thank you all so much. And thank you to everyone who has um, attended. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Well, I'm just sorry that we don't have more time because every time, you know, we, we get on Zoom, I feel like I would just like to sit back and, and chat with you all day. Um, so it will really be a pleasure to meet you in person. Um, yes, well, when I come to visit, we'll spend the whole day just chatting it up. <laughs> all right. That's, I'm going to hold you to that promise. Absolutely. Well, thank you um, to Aureen and to Diane for um, chatting with us today. And thank you to everyone who tuned in to watch. Please join us for our next episode of Nimwa Exchange Girl Power, which is on Tuesday, November 8th at 12 p.m. Eastern. We'll be chatting with um, Baltimore gallerist Mertiz Badola to learn about how she is championing 20th and 21st century African-American artists through her work at Gallery Mertiz in Baltimore. Uh, really looking forward to that chat as well. So put it on your calendars. And until then, everybody take care, be well, and enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye. Take care. Thanks, Diane. Bye.